Love you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, brother. I love you too. I'm tender today. I'm really tender every day, but especially tender today. I'm. What I want to talk about is um, transforming my whole world. And a year ago, last school of worship, the Lord started opening up a revelation to me. And maybe you all have already thought of this, but it was brand new to me. And it has literally been transforming my life ever since. And I feel like every time I go there, that I see something new I didn't see before. Um, so I want to pray for us because I can't, I can't do anything without praying. <laughs> I'm like helpless without him. Just hold out your hands. Father, thank you. Thank you for everything you're doing. Thanks that you're expanding our capacity to hold everything you're pouring out. We can't comp comprehend all of it, but our spirits are getting it. Our hearts are catching it. We're being transformed and changed. We feel it happening in the fibers of our being. And we ask, God, that you would just expand us a little more now. You expand our hearts and our spirits to take in what our minds can't comprehend. And would you change us again? Draw us nearer? No. Open our eyes to see that we have always been close that you've always been here, that you've always been closer than we knew you were. Help us to catch your heart, your original intent for humanity, your original desire to be near to us. In Jesus' name, amen. So I was listening. <laughs> I'm chomping on gum. It's for me. I apologize if it gets a little nasty for you, but it, it helps me. <laughs> So just get over it. I'll tuck it in every now and then. <laughs> tuck it in. So last year I was, um, I'm, I have a little girl. She's two and a half. Her name's Wonder. Yes, she is most of my um, Instagram feed. Um, and she is hilarious and she is brilliant. She's one of the most emotionally intelligent children I have ever met. And if you spend time with her, you'll know that. Like, I don't even, <laughs> I get in the rocking chair to read and talk to her and pray with her at night. And she just looks at me and goes, so, how was your day? <laughs> and I'm like, well, thanks for asking, so. And then I list off my day and she goes, oh, so how was your other day? <laughs> like, she just really... Really wants to lock in and connect. <laughs> Love her for that. <laughs> Love her for that. So we do, we listen to, have you ever heard of version? Okay, so we have the Bible app. We love it. That little girl loves her Bible app. She calls it monkeys because it starts with the creation story and she just, you can push the monkeys and they throw bananas at each other. You know what I'm talking about? She calls it monkeys. So I love that. I like it better than version. Monkeys. So we're listening to monkeys one day, and I'm like cleaning around the house, and um, for whatever reason, I, I let her listen to it while I was doing something. And I hear, I almost said out of the corner of my ear, but that is not the correct phrase. <laughs> Just a 90 degree angle in there. I, um, <laughs> I'm weird that way. So I'm, I'm listening to this, and all of a sudden, you know, <laughs> You know how Satan's voice is always just stupid and everything? Like, you know what I'm saying? It's because he really is ridiculous. He can't, he, he's always got this up to the same things. He can't do anything new. It's just stupid all the time. So I appreciate that he sounds stupid, but it's also funny. Because I hear in the background, did God say that you could not eat from the, I'm, and I'm like, really? You know, I'm like dying laughing. And then all of a sudden I start thinking about this story and I start thinking about like, yeah, what? Hey, hold on a second. What? Why did you even put the tree there? Why was the snake there? 
If he was so crafty, why would you even let him come around and be lying? Like all of a sudden I realized this is like a total setup. Has anybody ever thought that? Have you ever read Genesis and been like, really? I'm screwed. <laughs> you totally screwed us. <laughs> And all the while you're trying to hold on to like, I know you love me, but you screwed me. <laughs> I know I'm saying that a lot. Sorry, it's offensive. So, um, but really, these are my thoughts. <laughs> Just being honest here. <laughs> and I all of a sudden had this thought that I'd never had in my entire life. Like, why did you do that? Because I was taught growing up, you, we don't question God. And I'm like, now I figured out I have to. <laughs> How do you know anyone that you aren't willing to ask questions? Like, how can you know anyone or anything about them if you won't ask them about themselves? <laughs> if you just stay at a distance and assume, you just read a story about them and go, oh yeah, I, that's probably what I meant. No. You ask them about themselves. You ask them about the story. So I'm like, finally in this place in my life after all these years, where I'm like, I love asking questions. I'm asking them all the, all the time. If, if I feel like literally in my person, if he's not talking, that I'm slowly dying. <laughs> like to hear him speak makes me live. It holds me together. And so I'm, I start asking questions and I'm like, this could go really dark <laughs> or really well, depending on how you answer these questions. <laughs> so just being real honest about that. So what I want to do, I want to go back to the garden. And um, I want to read through it. I know it's a lot of reading, but it feels really important to give context, to give, everyone, give us a fresh thing. Um, also, there's so many things in there that I, you know, I haven't pronounced and before out loud in front of people. And I'm just going to, you know, I'm just going to let them roll off my tongue. And if you know it's wrong, just... Let me be. Just let it go. Give me grace. If you have your Bibles, turn to Genesis 1. I'll try to read um, quickly but clearly, but I'm, I get really excited when I read this story. I start freaking out a little bit. <laughs> um, if any of you have ever seen the Jesus Storybook Bible, if you're a parent, it's literally, yeah. If you're not a parent, you need to go get a Jesus Storybook Bible. I'm telling you, I fell in love with Jesus all over again reading that children's Bible. I've read children's Bibles my entire life, but when I opened that one with wonder, I literally cry through it, and she turns around to check on me because I, I cry. And, and like in, in this, cre I should have brought that one to read to you, but in, in the creation story, they describe it like this, that, that God starts to, that he greets things. Like instead of saying, um, hold on, let me like he says, hello, hello light, hello day, hello night. Like he greets it, like he says, he creates them by saying hello to them. It's like, it's so wild. It rocks me to my core, but anyways, I should have brought that, but okay. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void and darkness was over the surface of the deep and the spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness night. And there was evening and there was morning one day. Then God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. God made the expanse and separated the waters which were below the expanse from the waters, which were, <laughs> man, that's so all over the place, were above the expanse. Can you imagine seeing this? Like, what does that even mean? I mean, we're looking at something now that's changed over how many years? It's probably changed so much. That's so intense. Whew, my mind goes nuts. Like, I freak out when I read this. Like, I have birds flying past my face, and I smell all of it. Whew, so please be patient with me. <sighs> God called the expanse heaven, and there was evening, and there was morning a second day. Then God said, let the waters below the heavens be gathered into one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the gathering of the waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees on the earth, bearing fruit after their kind, 
with seed in them, and it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed after their kind. Did I read that? Yes, I did. And trees bearing fruit with seed in them after their kind, and God, <laughs> you know what, let's just move ahead. <laughs> let's just, I can see how this is gonna go. Yep, yep, we're gonna move on. That's okay. I'm too excited to read this. You just go back and read it yourself. <laughs> All right? Not to mention, I left my glasses on a plane <laughs> and I picked the tiniest Bible I own. <laughs> so that is my fault. We're moving on. There was, and there was light and day and it was all good. And, um, and then the fruit, bless it, multiply. And then God, bring forth living creatures of all the kinds. God made beasts, earth, man rule over them. Moving on, and then uh, then God said, <laughs> then God said, let us make, oh, I'm at verse 26, if you care to follow me, good luck. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our like, well, according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on, <laughs> so creepy. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Then God said, behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of all the earth and every tree which has fruit yielding seed, it shall be food for you. I want you to remember that passage. That's very interesting to me. Every plant yielding seed that is on the face of the earth and every tree which has, yielding, uh, which has fruit yielding seed, it shall be food for you. And to every beast of the earth and every bird of the sky, to everything that moves on the earth, which was life, which has life, I have given every green plant for food and it was so. God saw all that he had made and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. The creation of man and woman, chapter two. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed and all their hosts. By the seventh day, God completed his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it, he rested from all his work, which he had created and made. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created and in the day, the Lord, <laughs> in the day that the Lord God made earth and heaven, now no shrub of the field was yet in the earth, and no plant of the field had yet sprouted. For the Lord God had not sent rain upon the earth, and there was no man to cultivate the ground. But a mist used to rise from the earth and water the whole surface of the ground. Then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. The Lord God planted a garden towards the east in Eden, and there he placed the man whom he had formed. Out of the ground, the Lord had caused to grow every tree that is pleasing to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now a river flowed out of Eden to water the garden and from there it divided and became four rivers. The name of the first is Pishon and it flows around the whole land of Havilah where there is gold. <laughs> the gold of that land is good. The Bedellum and the onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is Gion. It flows around the whole land of Cush. The name of the third river is Tigris, and it flows east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. Then the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat from it you will surely die. Then the Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. Out of the ground, the Lord formed every beast of the field and every bird of the sky and brought them to man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called him, how fun would that be, man? That is crazy. I think I'm gonna call this one uh, an elephant. <laughs> Who thinks of that? <laughs> Adam, I think I'm gonna call this one um, a parakeet. I don't even know. It's so funny to me. <laughs> I think I'm going to call this the tarantula. It's so weird and fun. That's so fun to have that job. 
So the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. Then he took um, one of his ribs and closed up the flesh. At that place, the Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. Hmm. Flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Are you doing okay? Are you with me? I know that was brutal. Stick with me. (laughs) Just a little more, and then we're going to, like, dive in hardcore. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the women, Indeed, has God... (laughs) Indeed... Has God said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? (laughs) The woman said to the serpent, from the fruit of the tree (laughs) of the garden, we may eat. But from the fruit of the tree, which is in the middle of the garden, God said, you shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. The serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die. For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. Now, how many of you know If she had been in her right mind, she would have looked at him and said, but I'm already like God. For God knows in that day you will eat from it and your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its Yeah, she took from its fruit and ate. She gave it also to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to the man, and he said to him, where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. And he said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the tree (laughs) and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you've done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go and dust you will eat all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain, you will bring forth children. Yet your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. Then to Adam, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife, you have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you saying, you shall not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil, you will eat of it. All the days of your life, both thorns and thistles, it shall grow for you. And you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face, you will eat bread till you return to the ground, because from it you were taken. For you are dust, and dust you shall return. Now the man called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed, clothed them. Then the Lord God said, behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. And now he might stretch out his hand and take also from the tree of life, and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out from the Garden of Eden to cultivate the ground from which he was taken. So he drove man out, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he stationed the cherubim and the flaming swords, which he turned every direction to guard the way to the tree of life. We made it. I really felt like we needed to read it. I know that's a whole lot. Like, you're like, I so could have read that by myself. I think it's important for us all to be on the same page with it, to read it again, to make it fresh. So when I read this and I'm asking God questions, I'm going, why, why was the tree even there? I think I'm so used to reading this story in my past, and it's like this, what have you done? This is like, if you eat this, you're going to die. Like this, I'm, an, I'm going to snuff your life out if you don't listen to what I say. But it all started with a father who wanted a family. And I think that when he said, don't eat from this tree, I think he knew because he's a father and a friend and a lover. He knew that covenant, that intimacy, 
requires consent from two parties. For there to be real freedom, for there to be a choice made that was real, if he wasn't going to take their choice from them, then they had to have one. There had to be another option. It wasn't that he was looking to trip them up. He was going, well, to make the choice for this to be real for you, for you not to be a puppet, there has to be an option. <clears throat> and I think that when he knelt, I, I actually see this picture of God, like almost the father almost falling on his e knees, like, what have you done? You have no idea what you've done. And I don't think he was saying it like in a punishing way. I think he was saying, I knew that when you ate this, that you would know more than you should know right now. See, as a parent, I know that there's a lot of things that wonder has to know to grow up in her life. But if I told her too much right now, she couldn't comprehend it. She couldn't handle it. I'm not going to teach my two-year-old about sex. The father knew that if they were going to grow, that the appropriate time, it's not that he didn't want them to know. It's not that he was withholding from them, which is kind of, I think that the idea that we get, this is like bad, don't touch it. I'm withholding from you because I'm God. I actually think that he wanted to share. I think that he was just fathering them. And I think he was saying, if you know this, it'll kill you because you're not supposed to know yet. And once you know, you can't unknow. Once you've seen, you can't unsee. I think what happened with Eve, is that she got alone with herself. They're used to walking with God every day, right? And I think she probably got isolated, got in her head, walking around the garden, maybe getting a little jealous that Adam walks with them every day. Maybe getting a little peeved that she came from his rib. <laughs> like, Adam's your favorite. He's always your favorite. <laughs> yeah, I know. Tell me again. I'm from your rib. <laughs> I know. You made him first. So I'm the helper. <laughs> I get it. <laughs> Don't worry. I'll just be over here minding my own business, not eating the fruit. <laughs> This is the picture I get of Eve. We're all dangerous to ourselves when we get alone, aren't we? For too long. If the original design was family, if the original design was goodness, if we're ever going to get back to his original intent for us, everything that was made was good. It was all made for a good reason. Everything was flawless. He created it all and then stepped back and said, that is good. See, he means things when he says them. He meant it. They were born of him. They were spoken into existence by him. It was impossible for them to be flawed. But because he wanted us for covenant, we had to have the choice. And I think that history might have looked a whole lot differently had Eve just ran to her father, run to her father when she got a little crazy, when she started questioning, I don't, I'm feeling like I don't know if I can trust you. I'm, I have this weird thought in my head and I don't know where it's coming from. I have this weird thought that maybe you love Adam more than you love me and, and maybe I'm just here to be used and, and I have, I'm having this thought that you're, this whole tree thing, that you are withholding from me, that you don't trust me, that you are keeping secrets from me. What if she just run to her father and said, can we, go, can we go for a walk? I'm starting to forget what you're like. Can you, can we just go for a walk? I'm freaking out. What would have happened if she, when he came, when the father came looking for them, what would have happened if, Adam had just owned it. Yeah, I ate the fruit. If he hadn't just blamed Eve and Eve hadn't blamed the snake, what if everybody just took ownership and said, I, I did do that? 
I wonder what would have happened. If we didn't blame shift, if we didn't get alone, if we got vulnerable, if they'd gotten vulnerable in their humanity in that moment so that he could remind them, if they'd just taken a minute to worship. Because I don't think worship looked anything like it does now then. I think worship looked like an endless circle of communion. That it looked like they were so connected that they just kept telling each other why they loved each other. That God's looking at Adam and Eve going, oh, you're everything to me. I made you for the, and he's going on and on. And then what's their response? Oh, God, you're so good. They just go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And revelate and talk about things that were like barely trying to understand because they didn't have any of the shame then. They knew it was all good. It was before the lie came in. Just thoughts. Isn't it interesting that Eve probably thought that God was hiding something from them. But as soon as she ate, as soon as she believed the lie, as soon as she believed the lie, she was so isolated, so stupid in her own head that the first conversation she had with a snake, she bought in. She bought in. She, was, she, was, she had broken herself down to the point of being susceptible to anything at that point. Like to the point of, I, I, she was literally God breathed. She was made in the image of God, the father that she walked with in the garden. She literally physically had him. She was physically made in his image. Everything about her was made from him. But she was so broken down that by the time she had one conversation with a snake, she didn't even have enough strength to go, no, I, I actually am made in his image. I think there's so many things that are swirling in my mind, but I think today what I want to challenge, Everybody's bringing something and they all seem to connect more and more the more people speak. And it's like, well, I don't need to say that because it's already been said. But I think the more we tie all of this together that we're coming back, we're returning to his original intent for the, us, which is good. We, we've had this idea that we were kicked out of the garden, we screwed it up. That's our, that's our inheritance, that's our bloodline. We're human, we're gonna, we're gonna screw it up. But I, I think the real problem has been the identity crisis. We've, we've been in shame, we've been trying to fight shame ever since. The lie has been, you're withholding from me, you're hiding from me. And then what do they do? They try to hide. They believed he was lying to them. They believed that he was hiding from them. And I'm, I'm putting words in their mouth, I realize that. But to, to be that distant, that you would believe something like that, that, you have to go pretty far in your mind to get to that place. And I think, Holy Spirit, help, because there's, so there's so many things swirling right now. This is such a day. I think what I want for us today is make a, a conscious decision to step out from under the old way of thinking. The mindset that we are not good. The mindset that we're always working to come back. The truth is you weren't there and you didn't eat the fruit. This didn't start with you. And it didn't start with me. And maybe we would have made the same mistake. I don't know. I'd like to think no, but we still do it, I guess, in other ways. But I want us to get this, that we, 
we're born of goodness, that we're made of goodness, that every fiber of our being is good. We tend to make decisions based on, we like to think that we make decisions based on what we think God is like, but a lot of decisions we make, we make based on what we think we're like. We have a distorted image of God, and so we have a distorted image of us, and so we think he's like this, and we're bad, and so we have to spend all of our energy and our time fighting to believe something else. Um, Man. Sorry. I feel like super heavy. I didn't mean to go heavy on you. I'm thinking so much while I'm talking to you. Things I haven't heard before. Give me grace. This is like an ongoing process in my brains and my heart. So many new things that I think I read today, literally today, that I'm like, why don't you have time to work that in? My mind is just going. Maybe, can, can we just, I just feel like I am spinning in circles, but I feel like we're supposed to s- step out of this, like prophetically step out of it, out from under an old way of thinking. Um, and I could keep talking at you, but I, I just want you to stand with me. I actually thought I'd have way, I had way more to say before I stood up, so I'm just going to go with this. Because it's not, it's not coming, and everything I'm reading is like, ah, oh, no. I just think... When I read this today, I wondered kind of what, I'd never read this part before. At the very end. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to cultivate, cultivate the ground from which he was taken. Does that even make sense? He sent them out of the garden to cultivate the thing that he had given them in the garden. And, I, and I, I don't even know what all that means. So I'm not trying to be super profound. I just feel like there's something to it. I feel like we've, we felt like we were locked out of the garden. We've been trying to get back to the original thing. But I feel like he's given us, somehow, he wants to teach us to cultivate it. On the outside of what it looked like then. Oh man, Lord help me. If we don't start getting really real, getting really close to God and people, if we, if we continue to protect ourselves, like Dan and Danny were talking about earlier, if we continue as leaders to keep ourselves together, but deep, deep down inside, we don't actually believe that we're good. We don't know how to be vulnerable. We don't know how to get the mess out. We don't know how to be honest about what's really there. And I think we keep having this thing over and over. We have shame cycles. We have cycles of brokenness instead of unbroken circles. And that's what we were meant for. We were meant for unbroken circles. This was never to be ending. This was never supposed to break. His, his heart was never that for there to be sadness. None of that stuff was in his heart. But there was the choice and we had to make it. So I want... And we're all just doing this in our own lives. But I want you to ask the Holy Spirit in the stillness, in the stillness of your heart to show you what keeps you from running to the Father. Is there a lie that I've bought into that keeps me from believing that you're good and that I'm good?
Father, we ask that you would take us back, that you would uproot all the wrong beliefs about how it was always supposed to be. I really think if we can see what it was supposed to be, that we'll live differently. If we can catch your heart for us, the father, the family, the friendship, the intimacy, that we're really powerful in this. We're not stuck. But I ask that you would break off shame all over the room. You've been doing it all day. But Lord, I ask that you would go deeper than anything I could say or describe. It's, I don't even have to say anything that's really going to do it. You, only you can. Only we can give ourselves. You know, there's a difference when somebody is telling you the truth and when someone is actually bringing themselves with the truth. They're actually giving the gift of themselves. And I think as leaders, we have to learn to bring ourselves, not just a lesson, not just the truth. So if you would, humor me, because I keep seeing this. I know this is kind of weird. I don't even know what I'm feeling right now necessarily. But I, th I think we're supposed to step out of an old man that we've kind of been stuck in, like an actual prophetic act. Like I've just been in really into prophetic acts. So if you can in some way, good luck with this. If you can in some way take a step out to in another direction. <laughs> I know, if you're in there, you have to take an intentional step and literally see yourself taking off. Taking off the old way of thinking, just like peeling it back. Thank you, Father. You are good, good, oh, you are good, good, oh, you are good, you're good, oh, you are good, good. Oh, just sing it again. You are good, good. Oh, you are good. You're good. Oh, you are good. You're good. Oh, you are good, good. Now I want you to sing it to yourself. You are good. You're good. Oh, he said you are good. You're good. Oh, you are good. You're good. Oh, you are good. Good. you pick up all the pieces of all the things that I said and didn't say. And Father, I ask that you would let it go deep, 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 deep into our hearts and our spirits that you are good and we are born of you. And it makes us good too. And that you would rewrite the stories in our hearts and in our minds. That you would help us to read this again and see it for what it really is. That you were always a father looking for a family. That you were always looking for intimacy. And that we have a choice. And that we don't have to be alone. It was never meant to be like that. 
You said you put the lonely in families. I ask that everyone here who's been lonely would find a family. That isolation would be done in Jesus' name. That you would break off a spirit of isolation over your people. That you would draw them into relationship and real vulnerability, the real kind. Not just the kind where we tell the truth or we confess afterwards, the kind where we're in it forever together. Real covenant. That you would lift off shame once and for all. Shame is not our portion. Shame is not our portion. And I know we need to go. Amen. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you.